Hi, I'm Kieran Carr. I'm Archer GB's Paralympic Technician. Um, I design and modify Archer equipment for use by our para-athletes. Um, I've been working with them for three years. I'm an Archer GB judge. Um, I also lecture internationally on adaptive equipment uh, with the French head coach, Vincent Hylas. Before we look at the individual pieces of equipment, what we need to have is a general understanding of classification and what equipment is allowed in which classification. So the classifications we're going to look at today are W1, W2 and standing. In these categories we have, well in these classifications sorry, we have para-archery sports classes. The classes are W1 men and women and an open compound men and women and open recurve men and women. In each of the classifications we have the W1 um, which is the most severely disabled group of athletes and W2 and standing are combined into the two open categories. We need to understand how classifiers reach this decision. This is not a judge's decision to put them in a category, it is a classifiers, but we just need to have a general understanding of how they come to that conclusion. So during bench testing, classifiers will look at an athlete and check their impairment and their disability. Um, on the upper extremities, there is a total of 180 points. On the trunk, there is a total of 40 points. And on the lower extremities, there's a total of 100 points. During the bench testing, classifiers will go through and take off points for each, for each part of the athlete that is impaired or, or disabled. In the W1 classification, athletes have to have impairments on the upper extremities, on the trunk, and on the lower extremities. To be classified as W1, you have to have a combination of all three, and all three have to reach a certain milestone. In W2, it is normally only the legs that are affected, or the arms, um, which is why you see some archers using their feet to shoot, but are in a standing category, because they have no issues with their legs, even though they are sat down, because they couldn't physically shoot, holding the bow and standing up. In the standing category, is for all those other archers to classify. We need to understand in each of these classes that it is not necessarily a disability that allows you to be a para-archer. It is how your disability affects your ability to do archery. The golden rule for para-archery equipment is that assistive devices can only be used that match the level of impairment and are not authorised in order to enhance performance. This is a direct quote from the World Archery Classifiers Handbook. It is one of those things that is very, very difficult to judge how you are going to make someone better without giving them an advantage, but also allowing them to shoot. Over the next few slides, we're going to do a few comparisons over what is equipment and allowed and what is pushing the rules too far in able to enhance their ability to perform. To enable us to understand more of what is allowing an athlete to do archery and what is giving an athlete an advantage, I'd like to use this slide as a great example. The three things that have to be achieved to get an arrow to hit a target is we need to put energy into the bow and pull back, pull back the string. We need to point the arrow at the target, so aiming, and we need to be able to release the string. These are the only three things that are necessary to perform in archery. We don't need to cover all three with every athlete. If we have an athlete, for instance, that only has one hand and that hand is holding the bow, they can still pull back the string and let go with this hand. So we do not need to be able to rectify anything to do with pulling back the string or releasing the string. The only thing we might have to rectify is pointing the arrow at the target because without a hand, it's going to be very, very difficult to push away the bow. So this piece can be adapted to fit the needs of the athlete. This piece cannot because it works. We'll start by looking in depth at the W1 category. The W1 category is, as I said before, the most severely disabled athletes. This category, you will see more equipment adaptations because these are the people with the greatest level of need. The W1 open category is open to recurve and compound bows. The equipment rules are the same as world archery rules, except for the peak draw weight of the bow, regardless of recurve or compound, may only be 45 pounds. You may not have a peep sight or scope. You may not have a level, 
that you are allowed a release aid. A lot of W1 athletes have dexterity issues, so struggle to grip and move their fingers properly. Without the use of a release aid, most of the world of W1s wouldn't be able to shoot. Although it is open to recurve arteries, there are very, very few, and certainly none that I can think of worldwide at the moment, that shoot recurve in this category. Compound gives you such a big, big advantage due to weather conditions and the arrow traveling faster, it's easier for W1 athletes to shoot a compound bow at 45 pounds accurately than it would be for a recurve bow. The way I tend to look at W1 category, um, even with a compound bow, the simple way to look at the category rules is it is a compound bow with a release aid, but all other accessories have to be recurved. It's the simplest way I get myself to understand it, because you could look at every single individual piece of equipment and it gets quite complicated. But if you just get into your head that it's a 45 pound compound bow maximum with a release aid, but all of the sights and everything else have to conform to recurve rules. One of the big differences in W1 and W2 categories is also the strapping that's allowed. On W1 athletes, you can have multiple straps, for instance, over both shoulders to help hold you to the chair, or very, very large corset type straps. The very, very large corset type straps, although they look like they're giving the athlete a lot more stability holding to the chair, in fact, what it's doing is just stopping the athlete from collapsing. A lot of the time, W1 athletes have very, very low core level of movement and control. So if we didn't strap them into the chair properly, what could happen is as the athlete drew up to shoot, they would just collapse forwards, which is inherently dangerous. And in the wind, they'd get blown about left to right again, becoming very dangerous. So we strap them to the chair more for their safety and our safety than to actually improve their ability to shoot. Equipment adaptations in W1 can vary greatly. Um, one of the ones that I want to show you now is a release aid for one of the British athletes. When she draws back, she has very little movement in her fingers or hand. Any movement she has is quite sporadic. If she shot with a, a genuine, normal, off-the-shelf release aid, what would happen is any point during the draw cycle, her fingers could twitch, she could hit the trigger, and arrows could go anywhere. This is obviously dangerous, so to rectify this, what she actually has is an elbow-mounted strap, which comes forward to the hand. The release aid body is tied to the fingers here, uh, just below, or just below the bottom of the fingers here. And then as she draws back, she's got a bar on her release aid, pulls it against her chin, and as she pulls through, that release aid goes off, and then she can shoot. It means she can come down, so it's safe, because she's not physically attached to the trigger, and it works the same way in which a normal wrist release aid would, just set off on the chin, not using a finger. Something that we're gonna look at now is some high-speed footage of how that development process went. Um, we spent about two and a half, three years working on Vicky's release aid, um, and along with a lot of expert help in other industries, we've managed to get something that is tailor-suited to her exact needs. So the chin bar, the angle, the everything is exactly as she requires it, meaning that it's bespoke to her, so it's not an off-the-shelf thing. Um, so if we look at those videos now, and we'll just go through in a little bit more detail how it works and how we developed it without giving her the advantage that it looks as though she's got. So it's not an advantage we've given her, it's just giving her the best possible way of shooting within the rules. Another adaptation a lot of W1 and even open compounds have, um, but more so in the W1 category, is what we call a harness. So the harness fits around the chest, onto the shoulder, and the release aid is mounted on the shoulder. As an able-bodied athlete, I cannot use a harness because it gives me a massive, massive advantage because my release aid can't move, my anchor point is 100% guaranteed, and it just means I can be much more consistent than a human normally would be. If we compare these two pictures, the lower picture is of the same theory of device as the higher picture. The higher picture, as you can see, is a nice solid lump and it's attached and it's permanent. The lower picture is just a fabric harness means the release aid moves left to right, it moves up and down, it's not as consistent. If we look at these two devices just by themselves, the top picture will give a massive advantage to the athlete shooting because it is more consistent, because it is more solid, because it is more stable. If we look at the bottom picture, 
we can say that that athlete is going to be at a massive disadvantage because his equipment isn't as good. But this is where we have to draw the line. The line of the difference between being as good and being a performance enhancing piece of equipment. Both these athletes need to have this device. The difference is the one at the top costs about four and a half thousand dollars. The one at the bottom costs about $40. Although this sounds very, very unfair in that money can buy you points, it's the same in able-bodied archery. We can't say to a top compound archer in the world, you can't shoot a $300 release aid. You have to shoot the $20 release aid that somebody else shoots. It's unfair in terms of money will buy you scores, but it is unfair in all sport and in all forms of archery. It's not just power archery. So now we're going to have a look at recurve open and compound open categories. These two categories, the equipment rules, are the same as world archery rules. There are, however, a few minor differences and there are a few adaptations that you will see. The picture here of the recurve bow with a prosthetic hand attached to it is legal. Even though it's not the athlete's hand that's touching the bow, the bow is free to move in the hand and we'll take a closer look at another device but similar to this in a few slides time. One thing to be aware of with these two categories is the rules are the same. So we cannot put a compound scope, for example, on a recurve bow, that is not allowed. Um, we still have the 60 pound draw weight limit on compounds and we still have the same arrow diameter limit. But other than, other than the adaptations required to enable the athlete to shoot, we cannot change anything else. This slide shows two para-athletes equipment. We have one recurve bow, one compound bow. There are no differences between these two bows than there are for those able-bodied athletes. So we need to look at what we could change and what has been changed, certainly on the recurve bow, to enable the athlete to shoot. Other than this, there's no piece of archery equipment that has been modified. So this device is owned by an Australian athlete. Um, he has no wrist, or no wrist and fist, sorry. So he has uh, adaptation 3D scanned and printed that means he can put his fist into this adaptation, which then slots onto the riser. The bow is free to move forwards and backwards and left and right. It is not a solid fit, but it does mean he's able to shoot. He can't just use his fist into the riser because it's very unstable and very uncomfortable. The instability means that can could, in theory, become quite dangerous because the bow would be free to slide off the side. So this device was made with a big V that slides over the riser so that when he's at full draw, it cannot flick side to side, although it is free to move side to side if he wants to aim off or up and down, the bow will move and as he shoots, it will roll forwards. In the pictures we looked at a few slides ago, I said that the recurve bow had one slight adaptation to it that you probably couldn't see. That adaptation was a mouth tab. A mouth tab is normally a piece of webbing material or sometimes leather that's physically tied to the bowstring to enable the athlete to bite hold of it and pull back the bow by pushing it. And they can release by just opening their mouths. It is allowed to be attached to the string permanently because there would be no other way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> it is becoming a more and more common way of shooting. It does look a lot of the time like they've got a high draw, but because of the way they have to draw and the way in which your anchor point would work. If you're able-bodied and you anchor here, the, the direction or trajectory of your arrow is this high. If we move this up three centimetres to here, which is where mouth shooters shoot from, the trajectory of the arrow already becomes flat. So we need to aim higher to get the arrow to go, especially in the case of recurve, 70 metres. So you'll find that a lot of sights are a lot lower, and in some cases, even below the arrow. This is to enable the athlete to actually aim. This is the only piece of equipment that you need to be very, very careful of at equipment inspection. With a mouth tab, it has to go in the athlete's mouth. So what we want to try and do at equipment inspection is not touch the mouth tab. By all means, touch the string, look at it, make sure it conforms to the rules, but don't go and grab hold of it. That has to go in the athlete's mouth and it wouldn't be pleasant if you had something on your hands and you put it on there and then they have to bite hold of it and put it in their mouth. The other thing to be careful of is when you're touching their riser or the rest of their equipment during equipment inspection is that the back of these risers and bows will be covered in saliva. It sounds disgusting and sometimes it can be, 
but it is just one of those unfortunate things. They can't help it. Every time they shoot, when they let go of the string, saliva will come out of the mouth on the mouth tab and just get splattered on the back of the riser. So just make sure after equipment inspection that you've checked a mouth shooter's bow, just clean your hands thoroughly. And again, avoid touching the mouth tab. One thing we need to be certain of in all categories, W1, W2 or standing, is that all adaptations aren't archery specific. If we look at three prime examples, wheelchair, stools and prosthetics, these three items, very few of us will know anything about because inherently we do archery, we understand archery, not all of us use wheelchairs, not all of us use stools, not all of us use prosthetics. It's a lot easier for things to be missed or rules to be bent using these three pieces of equipment because it's harder for judges and classifiers to understand completely what the differences are. So we're going to take a slightly in-depth look at some different wheelchair stools and prosthetics. As we said, some archery equipment isn't modified or adapted. So if we look at these two pictures on the left here, the compound archer and the recurve archer, the actual archery equipment as such is exactly the same as an able-bodied athlete would use. There is no adaptation, no modification. It is off the shelf standard equipment. But in order them to compete fairly and equally, if we look at the pictures on the right, the compound archer has a prosthetic leg. Without this prosthetic leg, she wouldn't be able to shoot. A lot of archers now have a prosthetic designed specifically for shooting and an everyday prosthetic for walking. A lot of the walking prosthetics have moving joints, have uh, flex and give in them, whereas the shooting prosthetics tend to be a lot more solid. The athlete on the right, the recurve athlete, if he is shooting from a stool, if you saw him walk around, you'd think, I don't think he needs to use a stool, but he is very, very unstable on his feet. He can go for 10 yards and look absolutely fine. But if he's on the shooting line, as soon as he starts to pull back and the center of gravity moves, he will just fall over, which is obviously inherently dangerous, which is why he is allowed to shoot from a stall. If we look at the wheelchair, the wheelchair must conform to the general use of the meaning of the word wheelchair. It is one of my favorite rules because it basically says it's a wheelchair. Everyone knows what a wheelchair is. All of you walk down the line at your next event and tell me how many different types of wheelchairs there are. There are thousands. The general rules are the top, the highest point of the wheelchair cannot be any closer than 110 millimeters from the armpit while the athlete is at full draw. So not while the athlete is sat down, but while the athlete is at full draw, must be 110 clear millimeters under the armpit. The other important rule is it can only come to half the width of the athlete's trunk. This rule is very important and was recently modified. This is because if we have our whole trunk wrapped around like this, we can actually be strapped into the chair and making it really, really stable. This gives an unfair advantage over those people that aren't strapped into their chair. What you see a lot of people doing, especially when they're learning um, to shoot from a wheelchair, is they'll lean into the side or into the back. This is not allowed. This gives you that extra stability that you wouldn't normally have. If you need that extra stability for safety reasons, it can be classified by the classifiers, but it will be included on the classification card. Stools. Stools come in lots of different shapes and lots of different sizes. And trying to understand why archers use these and what the rationale behind using the different stools are can be quite complicated and challenging. So hopefully in this section, we're just going to have a quick overview and try and understand. Most stools are three legged. The reason they're three-legged is they're easy to travel with and a triangle on the floor is the most stable shape. Which leg do you have forwards and which leg do you have backwards? You have the left leg forward, uh, the, the single leg forwards and or the single leg backwards. Does that make it better or worse depending on your disability? Most people who are unstable on their feet and might have a reaction to kick or push with their feet, if they have the single leg backwards, it stops the stool from being able to tip, which makes it more stable for them. If you're going to sit on top of the stool, so you have no real leg issues with twitching and movement, then you'd have the two legs at the back because then your weight is over the center point and it's a lot easier to shoot. There is no right or wrong way, but most people now will shoot with the single leg backwards. 
just because it's more stable if you do kick off the floor. Something else we need to look at at stalls. So the picture on the left um, is a perfectly legal way of shooting with a stall. You have the three legs on the floor and you have the two legs of the athlete on the floor just outside the leg. So in overview, adaptations for para-archery come in so many different shapes and sizes. You're not expected to know what is legal and what is not for every single person and every single eventuality. Anything that has been modified to enable them to shoot would appear on the classification card that you'll check at equipment inspection. And if you're unsure or unsure why or how something works, speak to the athlete, speak to the coaches after the event has finished or before the event starts, just to get some understanding. Most athletes and coaches would be more than happy to explain why they do something or how it helps their archer. If not, you can always drop my email. My email's on the front slide and then I can try and answer your questions. I look forward to hearing your questions later on.